Hi guys, welcome back to the channel, FPL Consult here and in today's video I'm going to share with you my updated Game Week 7 wildcard draft. Now this should be useful for those on a wildcard but those of you not on a wildcard, I think in terms of looking at the players that Game Week 7 would target from here on out, this should also be helpful. So if you guys do enjoy this one, please do drop a like, please do subscribe as well. We are on the road to 10,000 subscribers so if you guys could help me out and just scroll down a little bit, I would really appreciate if you could hit the subscribe button. So let's get on with the video and let's start with the kind of overall big picture view of this draft. The team value is 100.7 million. The formation I've gone with here is a 3-4-3 still and the AI rating for this draft that I've put into the Fantasy Football Hub AI tool is 96%. So decent enough, I think in terms of optimizing the next few game weeks, uh, maybe five game weeks worth of fixtures, this draft does it pretty well. So in terms of the picks that I've gone for, I have gone for Raya in gold and Fabianski as the backup keeper. So talking about Raya first, to put him into context as well, he is part of a double Arsenal defence that I'm going with, with Gabriel in defence as well. The thinking behind still going for double Arsenal defence, despite them conceding two goals against Leicester, is that I still back them as a solid defence moving forward. Yes, I know that after Southampton and Bournemouth in game week 8, it gets tricky for the next three game weeks, but thereafter, I do want Raya long term. And I think the cost saving by going for Raya instead of Saliba just goes so far in enabling this draft to be expensive elsewhere. So I do think like Raya and Gabriel as a defensive double up is where I see myself going for the long term, at least until the next wildcard. So I still think I'd go for Raya and Gabriel on a Game Week 7 wildcard. Very similar to those on a Game Week 6 wildcard as well. And I'm not put off by the Leicester game. In fact, in that particular game, they only conceded 0.27 expected goals. So in other words, Leicester were pretty fortunate to get two goals. On another day, maybe the, the clean sheet is still intact. So that's for the Arsenal defenders and Raya as well. Now speaking about the other defenders I've gone for here, there's Vardial and Poro in the starting 11. And then there's Aignuri and Greaves on the bench. So speaking about Vardial first, the reason why I've gone with him here is obviously in terms of Man City's fixtures from Game Week 7 onwards, they get really good. It's a sea of green. And it also begs the question as to whether we should get another City asset. Now aside from Haaland, I think Varial is the next best asset to own for a couple of reasons. We did see him play in the advanced positions against Newcastle, which was where he technically operated towards the later half of last season. And that was where he was getting so many attacking returns. So you see in that one game already of him playing in the advanced position, that the attacking returns come. So the quality is still there. I don't doubt him as a player. And I think in terms of the setup that enabled him to do that, it was Carl Walker playing at right back and Rico Lewis slot in the midfield next to Kovacic. So in that kind of a setup, basically when Carl Walker is in that right back spot, he would be able to fill in as part of a back three, allowing Vardial to venture forward. And in those setups, Varial is able to go up there. I won't discount the fact that there will be other setups that Pep can potentially use that would involve Varial just sitting back a little bit more defensively as we saw in game weeks 1 to 5. So in those kind of cases, I do think like maybe the appeal of Varial goes down a little bit. But now in game week 7 when we are making a call to go for another City asset, I think we take the gamble on Varial playing that advanced position. And in the worst case scenario, if he just stays defensively, at least the fixtures are there for, for him to still get clean sheets. And at the end of the day, in terms of defensive assets wise, he feels to me the safest to go for as well in terms of expected minutes. So that's my thinking behind Vardial here at 5.9 million. Obviously, if he does end up playing in that advanced position, I think he's well worth the 5.9 that we're paying for him. Now, in terms of Poro as the last defensive asset here in the draft, I've gone with him with a couple of um, you know rotations and kind of thinking in mind here. The first I would say is that with Poro, I'm not going to say that I outrightly back the Spurs defense that much. I know they are they are kind of capable of conceding a couple of loose goals here and there if they do switch off in defence, which we've seen this season already, that they could concede a couple of goals even to slightly weaker oppositions. But for me, Poro is just not reliant so much on clean sheets but also on attacking returns. 
And at the end of the day, I am paying 5.5 million here. So I asked myself before putting him into the draft whether I think moving forward there could be a potential of double digit hauls where he gets clean sheets and attacking returns. And I do think like there are those kind of fixtures for him moving forward. Yes, there are a couple of tricky ones. Um, and I do think like in those kind of tricky ones, maybe I bench him for 8 Nuri, which we'll speak about in a bit. But if not, in those kind of plum fixtures for him, I would be very happy to just start him with the threat that he possesses in attacking positions. Now, just one thing to speak about Pedro Porro is that I think in recent times, he seems to have been less attacking. But after Udogi came off yesterday in the uh, game against Manchester United, then I think we also saw Pedro Porro then subsequently push forward a little bit more as well. So I, I think when Udogi is on the pitch, Yudogi felt to me as if he was the one that was further forward. And now that you know Yudogi is out for a while, it seems to me like Poro is going to be the one that is more advanced. So I think just something to think about. Not something that's going to put me off massively, but something that I observed yesterday in the Manchester United versus Tottenham game. Now, that's for Poro. The last two defenders on the bench, Aid Nuri and Greaves. The thinking behind Aid Nuri here is, yes, I know that people think Wolves are a very bad defence, but you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. When you look at the first six game weeks and the fixtures they've had, they've played Liverpool, they've played Chelsea, they've played Arsenal. I mean, you look at the fixtures that they had, it is truly a bad run of fixtures and that could you know, potentially explain why they're so far down the table and conceded so many goals. But now when you look at their fixture run, starting from game week 7, it's Brentford away. In game week 8, sure it's Man City, it's also tough, but that's where rotation comes in here and 8 Nuri's on the bench. And thereafter from game week 9 onwards, it's a sea of green fixtures for Wolves. And to me, they don't feel like a relegation side. Like I look at the way they played against Liverpool as well. There are quality players in that side and they are also capable of getting results and stringing kind of wins together as long as the fixtures permit. And I do feel like looking at the fixtures moving forward that that could be the case, especially for Aid Nuri. So I do think going for him here, especially with him only being at 4.4, could be a bit of a steal. We know the attacking threat that he possesses. So again, not only clean sheets that he relies on. And yeah, I just like the appeal of 8 Nuri for the long term all the way until the next wild card. For Greaves here, it's a pretty simple thinking in that he's just a 4.0 million bench fodder. And Ipswich do have a very nice run of fixtures coming up if I do need to play him. Now, just a bit of a kind of a nugget for Greaves is that he did make a mistake to give the ball away to Morgan Rogers, who obviously scored his first goal of the season. So that felt to me like it was one of the first few mistakes I've actually seen Greaves make. If not aside from that, he feels to me like a very solid kind of defender for Ipswich. And obviously, with how big he is in stature-wise, I obviously do think like he is a big threat from set pieces as well. So that's why I've still gone with him here as the 4.0 million bench fodder. If not, there we go with the defenders as well as the goalkeepers. Let's have a look at the midfield. So in midfield, I have Mbumo, Johnson, Rogers, Palmer, as well as McNeil on the bench. So let's start with the most expensive player, and that's Cole Palmer, who's currently at 10.7 million. So pretty expensive, already risen 0.2 million above his starting price tag. I think that obviously comes down to the fact that he scored four goals in the first half of the Brighton game. And he just looks so sharp at the moment. I think I cannot see myself going without Palmer on a Game Week 7 wildcard. Initially, when the four goals were going in, I was thinking still the fixtures moving forward are difficult. I don't think I would go for Cole Palmer. But upon further kind of analysis of the fixtures, I look at the Newcastle game and I actually think that Newcastle away, they tend to struggle. So Cole Palmer technically would not really have much difficulty in getting attacking returns there. Despite, you know, Newcastle doing pretty well against Man City, I still do think away from home they are quite a different side. And then Manchester United in the game week after that, also not too difficult. So really over the next five game weeks, the ones I'd be concerned about is the Liverpool game and the Arsenal game. Aside from that, he's actually a fine hold after the Arsenal game all the way until the next wild card. So I do think like thinking about it from that perspective, I felt, okay, maybe it's worth putting Palmer into the draft. Obviously, a couple of compromises would then have to be made. The most obvious one here is not having Saka. So I've made up with not having Saka by going for Harvards up front. It's a bit of a spoiler, but it helps me to kind of explain why I think going for Cole Palmer here, by all means, you could also fit Saka in this draft as well. But then you also want to include a couple of premium defenders here and there. You have Haaland up front um, and other kind of 
forwards that you want to go for, say for example Solanke, in which case the draft gets very expensive and you don't have a lot of bench depth. So I didn't want to compromise on the rotations that I kind of like in a draft whenever I'm you know, making a wild card draft. So because of that, I've had to compromise in going without Saka, try to cover that with Harvard's up front, which we'll speak about in a bit, and then just having Palmer here with the intention to keep him from game week 7 all the way until the next wild card. So in that respect, because I'm not only focusing on the short term, where truly the fixtures are not maybe the best, and I'm really going for the long term pick here, I think Palmer across this, you know, kind of 10 to 12 game week spin, I'm fine to have him here. So he's in the draft, and I do think like, you know, moving forward, people will also start to be shipping him in, especially after the kind of, you know, difficult fiction run that they have. So you are kind of hopping on early a, bit, a little bit here. Now looking at the next um, kind of most expensive pick, it's Mbumo. I don't think I need to speak too much about him. I just would say that I he's been scoring in every game so far in the first minute. So that feels a bit crazy to me. I don't think he keeps it up. But in terms of, you know, him being able to get returns in, in general, looking at the games that Brentford have moving forward, I think it's still there. And the fixtures are also still there. So very talismanic in Bumo with 90 minutes, penalties, etc. Just kind of a, a no-brainer asset to have in a Game 7 wild card. Now, Brennan Johnson here at 6.4 million. He's a player that I've gone for mainly because I do think like Spurs moving forward will get a good number of attacking returns. I think looking at the way they played against Manchester United, it's just a reminder of how attacking they can be. And even when it was 11 versus 11, they were dominating the game and Brennan Johnson was getting majority of the good chances as well. So it was kind of him as well as Solanke getting the lion's share of big chances. And so uh, Johnson here at 6.4 million for me feels like a very good entry, uh, cheap entry into the Spurs attack. And I like the fact that he is kind of the one that is finishing majority of the chances that Spurs have of late. So four goals now in the last four games for him in, in uh, all competitions so far. So I think Brennan Johnson with the form he's at is a pick that I want to go for on a game week seven wild card. And then Morgan Rogers here and McNeil who's on the bench. So the thinking behind both of these players is they're kind of not exactly budget kind of midfielders in that they're not really 4.5 million. They're kind of slightly more expensive. Rogers is now at 5.2. McNeil is at 5.6. And I am kind of spending a little bit more money on them because I do think like the rotations moving forward will be quite key. Now, we know that McNeil has a very good run of fixtures moving forward. But I also think that the appeal of Rogers is definitely there. I look at the way Villa are playing. Yes, defensively, they do struggle. But Rogers is still playing very attackingly and getting into very good positions. So uh, just a small concern that I have about Rodgers is that there was some tightness in his hamstrings and that's why he was taken off against Ipswich. So just something to monitor, but if he's fine and fit to go for game week seven, then he'd be in the draft for me to rotate with McNeil moving forward. And also having eight Nuri there, kind of it's a bit of a backup in which case where if McNeil and Rodgers both have bad fixtures, I could also go with a 4-3-3 formation and start eight Nuri in, in defense instead. So I, I won't actually say that McNeil and Rogers are the only ones that will be rotating. I think a 4-3-3 is also a decent consideration for this draft, considering eight Nuri does have decent fixtures moving forward as well. So that's the thinking behind Rogers and McNeil. I think to speak about a, a bit about McNeil and why I've chosen to go for him, the Everton fixtures are really so good right now. And I look at how advanced McNeil is playing. From open play, he's getting a very good number of shots. And also, when I consider the routes to points for him, he's on majority of set pieces. And Everton do have very good aerial threats from set pieces like Tarkovsky, like Dominic Calvert-Lewin, who are all very capable of scoring from set pieces. So McNeil just has that added kind of advantage in that he has different routes to points. And obviously, based on the form that he's shown recently, in fact, throughout the, the whole of the season so far, he's picked up a very healthy number of returns in terms of goals and assists as well. So I like the appeal of McNeil. And I think also at the ownership that he's at, he could be a very good differential to have. Rogers is obviously the more popular one, but I think McNeil is a little bit of an... Uh, of a spicy differential, if, if I may. So there we go to the midfielders. Let's have a look now at the forwards to wrap up this draft. So up front, it's Harvard's Haaland and Cunha. And this time I want to speak about the cheapest player first in Cunha. So I know what people think about the Wolves attack. I don't think it's one that immediately screams out to us as, as scoring a lot of goals. 
But I want to call out the fact again about the first six game weeks and how bad the fixture run was. So I'm going to rattle off the teams that they've played in the first six game weeks. It's Arsenal in game week one, followed by Chelsea, Nottingham Forest, Newcastle, Aston Villa and Liverpool. I don't think you see a worse fixture run this season than Wolves have had in the first six game weeks. And even the slightly easier fixture for them, Nottingham Forest, was away from home. And we also know this season that Forest have been playing pretty well. So it was a truly terrible run. And I think given that was the case, I don't expect Wolves to do very well. So obviously they suffered in terms of attacking returns as well as kind of defensive performances. But also when I look at Cunha's performances within these kind of difficult fixtures, he was still able to get returns. He still put up decent enough numbers against you know tough oppositions. And against Villa and Chelsea were the games that he put up attacking returns. So I think when I think about it in this perspective, and I look at the fixtures moving forward, I actually think that Cunha could be a very good differential because especially looking at his ownership now, he's so low owned. We're jumping early here on this Game Week 7 wildcard draft. We're going to go early with Cunha at 6.5 million. I do think like there is a lot to like about Cunha in that he's... Guaranteed 90 minutes, he is the talisman for Wolves, I would say. And I look at the positions he takes up, it's very promising. And he gets a good number of chances every single game as well. And he's a very clinical finisher. Like, based on past seasons, you'd see that, you know, generally when Wolves score, uh, especially towards the later half of last season, Cunha was very involved in that. So, I do like Cunha, and also the fact that he's on penalties, I forgot to mention. So, I think Cunha overall, as what he offers at the 6.5 million bracket as a whole package, I do like it. And I just like having generally a differential player in my draft. So for game week 7, he is the one that I go for here in the forward positions. Erling Haaland, I'm not going to speak too much about him. He is a lock in the game week 7 wild card. And I think moving forward, he goes, he's going to be the captain for this draft for majority of the game weeks. Now, Harvard's here is the one I spend, I want to spend a bit more time on. He has Southampton at home in game week 7 and then Bournemouth away in game week 8. And then I probably swap him for Solanke in game week 9. So, I think he could very well go with Solanke right from the get-go in game week 7. But the thing I'm quite wary about is going too heavy on Spurs, especially just after that, you know, good performance against Manchester United. Like, I know they did very well, but I also know that, you know, not too much has changed in the games before as well, in that that was kind of the same side that, that you know, Spurs were operating with, where the same players were there. Even Son was, was in uh, the Spurs side for those games, yet they did struggle a bit against, you know, weaker opposition. So I, I'm quite wary of going so heavy on Spurs. And if I go for Solanke up front here, I'm basically tripled up on Spurs already. So just to kind of balance it a little bit, I've gone with Havertz here, who also has very decent fixtures in the next two. Also helps me to kind of get the third Arsenal asset for these two game weeks. And then I jump over onto Solanke from game week nine onwards. So that's kind of thinking behind why I've gone with Harvards here. But I also do know that that is booking in a transfer and that may not be the wisest choice. So let me know in the comments down below, with this Game Week 7 draft, would you rather go for uh, Solanke in place of Harvards here? But that pretty much means that you won't have an Arsenal attacker. If not, you have to find a way to get maybe Saka in, in, in the midfield. And then again, other compromises have to be made. So let me know what you guys think of this kind of last forward spot here. That's the, the one that I'm kind of the least sure of at this point. But aside from that, when I look at this draft in totality, I like how balanced it is. And I also like that long term, you capture a lot of the players that would kind of be the mainstay all the way up to your next wild card. So AI has given this draft a rating of 96%, which gives me an indication as well that they do think in the near future that this team is able to kind of get a good number of points as well. So there we go with this draft. Hopefully it helps you guys on a Game Week 7 wild card. And if you're not on a wild card, also identify a couple of players that moving forward would be good players to target, especially players like Brennan Johnson, Cunha, Ed Nuri on the bench as well. Special mention to him. So let me know what you think of this draft, what changes you would make, what players I'm sleeping on. I'd be keen to know in the comments down below. And if you're on a wild card, drop your draft in the comments as well. I'll have a look and I'll reply to it too. So if, if not, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Please do drop a like. Please do subscribe as well. And I will catch you guys in more Game Week 7 content coming very soon. Bye-bye.